you know anything about martial arts studies, you should know something about Ben Judkins. Ben Judkins started the blog Kung Fu Tea, which is about Wing Chun and Chinese martial arts in 2012. And it was the conversations that he started on that blog with his long essays, weekly, sometimes twice weekly essays, that really started the conversation about martial arts studies in the English language. In 2015, Ben was a keynote at the first martial arts studies conference at Cardiff University. And that was five years ago. Uh, it was a monumental time. It was a monumental presentation. It was on Wing Chun, Ip Man, and the globalization and growth of Kung Fu. And I decided it would be a great time to share it again with you now. So what follows is Ben Judkin's keynote at that first conference and the Q&A discussion afterwards, both of which are absolutely fascinating. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for that warm introduction. I am Ben Judkins. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about Ip Man, globalization, and the growth of Wing Chun Kung Fu. Now, in April of 2011, Hong Kong Airlines did something that at first seems out of character. Most airlines seeking a share of the lucrative business class markets attempt to entice you in with pictures of their genteel and sumptuous cabins. Some airlines appear to be in an airsats arms race to find ever more attractive and demure flight attendants to stock those cabins. Instead, Hong Kong Airlines announced that their flight crews would be taking mandatory training in a type of southern Chinese hand combat called Wing Chun. Now, having earned a, uh, a reputation as a street fighting art on the rooftops of Hong Kong in the 1950s, this move at first appears to be somewhat paradoxical. It's one thing to quietly train your cabin crews in rudimentary self-defense skills. I have a brother who's a flight attendant, you know, so he learned these, this is where we keep our flex cuffs, this is how we put the flex cuffs on people, right? But it's another thing to start offering press releases, posting YouTube videos, you know, going on Hong Kong television to show how an unruly customer might be restrained. Now, it would be, there we go, yeah. It would be wrong to suggest that there has never been any glamour associated with Wing Chun. I mean, there certainly has. This was, after all, the only martial art that Bruce Lee ever studied, well, that he ever studied completely formally. But when you juxtapose, you know, a picture of you know, a flight attendant from Hong Kong Airlines or, or any of the you know, uh, competitors, uh, their commercials with uh, battered and bloody Lee from the promotional material for Enter the Dragon, you really have to ask, you know, what do the advertising executives of Hong Kong Airlines know about their regional markets that we do not? Now, on purely historic grounds, I find it rather odd that anyone seeking the past should ever remember Wing Chun, or really most of the southern Chinese martial arts at all. The blunt truth is, uh, you know, China's a different place from Japan. For a lot of China's history, the martial arts have not really been very popular. Now, of course, that's the kind of statement that once you make it, you have to qualify in all kinds of ways. So there have always been groups of people who have specialized in martial arts. And during, during you know, periods of uh, civil uprising, lots and lots of people get dragged into militia training. But still, the better class of society went out of their way to disassociate themselves from these practices. And even when they were you know, leading militias and stuff like that, they certainly didn't talk about it. You know, they didn't even put it in their, in, in their official biographies very often often. Um, as a matter of fact, let me get to my next slide here. When Bruce Lee starts to study, you know, Wing Chun with his teacher Ip Man in Hong Kong in the 1950s, there are probably less than a thousand Wing Chun students in all of Hong Kong. When Ip Man is studying Wing Chun with his Sifu or his teacher back in Foshan at the turn of the 20th century, there are less than two dozen people in his particular lineage of the art. So the very first thing that we have to wrap our minds around uh, is that in many ways, studying the traditional Chinese martial arts is a quintessentially modern activity. 
right? And that's not normally the way that we talk about it. So given this disconnect from reality, a lot of my research over the last couple of years has focused on understanding how exactly the southern Chinese martial arts came to be such strong symbols of local identity. But today, I'm going to make a left-hand turn on you, and instead I'd like to look at why some arts, like Wing Chun, have succeeded in the global arena when others related, you know, even some of Wing Chun's close cousins, have kind of quietly slipped into obscurity. Okay, what does this tell us about the nature of the martial arts themselves when you look at those that succeeded and those that kind of went into that good night? And what does it suggest about individuals, about the threats that they perceive to themselves in the face of rapid economic, social, and cultural change? Now, the techniques of the martial arts can have a very long history. They might go back hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. I mean, there are only so many ways to hit someone with a stick. Yet the story of Ip Man, Bruce Lee, and the success of Wing Chun, I think really nicely illustrates uh, that the arts that succeeded, the arts that we interact with today, succeeded because they are modern, global practices. And of course, this is not how we traditionally think about them. Well, Ip Man and his students, uh, including Bruce Lee, are going to be headlining today's talk, and you know, they, they provide a lot of our, our nice visuals. In many ways, it's, it's globalization that actually provides the terrain that we are going to be exploring. Uh, originally rooted in the birth of European modernity, this is a system of rapid social, economic, and cultural change that has now reached out to touch every area of the globe. Like China, um, much of the world was first kind of brought into globalization during the 19th century, during the rush to construct free trade systems. Um, now, when you look at some really important events in Chinese history, things like the Taiping Rebellion, the Opium Wars, various sorts of uh, violent imperialism, the civil disturbances that followed, it's really important not to ignore the kind of systemic factors that were out there that contributed to this. It's also really interesting to note that when you think about the martial arts that are the most successful today, the ones that you see the most often, things like Tai Chi and, and Wing Chun, a lot of these arts were either created during this late 19th century period, or they were really kind of reformulated and popularized during exactly this period. Now, authors like Douglas Weil have suggested some reasons why this should not be particularly surprising to us. Well, we'll talk about him a little bit later in the talk. But then on the topic of globalization, what's really interesting to me is to see that by the time you get to the 1960s and 70s, when you get wonderful typefaces like that, you see another explosion of interest in the martial arts. You know, it hits another peak as globalization is going up again. Okay? But just as the martial arts are a really complex subject, and so sometimes you need multiple ways to think about them to triangulate what's going on, that's why Paul and I are always harping on interdisciplinarity, uh, there's more than one way to think about the challenges and the opportunities that are posed by globalization, right? A more conventional, empirically driven understanding of globalization says this is something that we see. It's a phenomenon that exists. Whenever we see increasing flows of goods meaning trade, capital, or money, and labor, or people crossing previously closed boundaries. But this is a rather simple conceptualization of graduate school, it's the, or sorry, of, uh, of globalization. It was the kind of thing I was introduced to in graduate school when I was taking my basic economics classes. And, and it's a very materialist understanding of the uh, process, which is to say it's kind of limited. Still, it does point out some really important factors that, you know, any art like Wing Chun or any traditional process is going to have to take into account when it is expanding into international markets. But this isn't the only way to think about globalization and the obstacles and, quite frankly, the opportunities that globalization provides for the Asian martial arts. 
Peter Bayer, in his work on the continuation of organized religion in the modern era, uh, points out that we can also conceptualize globalization as increased um, flow of ideas, or he terms it modes of communication between previously isolated communities. Now, Bayer goes on to note that this sort of transformation, where we see a transformation in the way that individuals and society relate to each other, has profound implications for any social institution responsible for transmitting fundamental social values. And of course, this is exactly the way that the Chinese martial arts came to be reconceptualized and understood by martial arts reformers in China during the late 19th and the early 20th century. Modernization theorists uh, long suspected that these sorts of traditional identities would vanish in the modern era. We wouldn't see religion. We wouldn't see ethnicity. And for the most part, China's May 4th intellectuals agreed with them. They, they went a step further. They said, yep, and on top of that, you are not going to see the traditional martial arts because their value structure is too futile. It's too backwards. This is something that these are practices that cannot survive in the modern era. Well, needless to say, none of this has actually come to pass, right? Religion is still in the world today. Uh, regional identity is as strong as ever and is growing in certain respects. And most importantly for today's talk, more people are doing Wing Chun now than have ever done Wing Chun in the past at any point. So how do these practices survive in a changed world? By evolving. That's what they do. More specifically, while ra rapid modernization may solve certain technical or economic dilemmas for us, it's like doing acupuncture with a fork, right? You know, you poke one thing, you solve that one thing, but you poke a bunch of other stuff too, and you never know what secondary problems you are going to create. In fact, you create a lot of secondary problems with economic and social change. And that's important because it presents the guardians of traditional ways of mediating and defining social meaning with an opportunity. On the one hand, they can find new ways of solving problems and marketing the solutions of problems. In essence, they can turn themselves into the purveyors of a specialized skill set, which really conforms to the demands of modernization, of how modern economies are supposed to work. Or, on the other hand, they can double down on these more basic questions of social meaning, and they can reinforce identity. And in fact, this is one of the problems that we have in the modern world, is that identity increasingly becomes a scarce commodity as uh, the boundaries of it kind of break down under the, the, the forces of globalization. So we have two strategies. But the critical thing to realize is that neither of these are really traditional. Both of them, in fact, are a response to the challenges of globalization and an accommodation to modernity, no matter how traditionally you continue to market your martial arts brand. And this is really where the debate about Ip Man, who he was, what he taught, what sort of art Wing Chun really is, this is where that all enters our picture. Right? As we look at discussions within the Wing Chun clan today, we see this debate. What does Wing Chun need to do to survive? Does it need to evolve? Does it need to address current problems? Do we need to be into self-defense and address Brazilian jiu-jitsu? Or does Wing Chun survive because it tells us something more fundamental about who we really are as people, right? And what our value is. Is it about being, you know, authentic? I also like this framework because it helps to explain this kind of perpetual quest that we see, especially on the internet, but in all kinds of places, to find the more ancient, the more authentic roots of these practices. Right? If you ask me where does Wing Chun come from, my Wing Chun, I should really say that guy in the strip mall. Right? That's where it comes from, but no one ever says that guy in the strip mall, right? You know, where do we go? Red Boat Opera, you know, Lung Jan, right? You know, I've never met him, but you know, somehow we all know that that is what is authentic. Now, 
Ip Man did more to increase Wing Chun's profile as a regional art after his flight to Hong Kong in 1949 than anyone else. And, and that really set the stage for its current global success. But one can't really understand the global growth of Wing Chun or, to be honest, the Asian martial arts in general without appreciating the role of his better known student, Bruce Lee. Right? Lee is in some ways the axiomatic figure in any discussion of the late 20th century internationalization of the Asian fighting arts. While some individuals in North America and my own country um, were familiar with the Asian martial arts prior to Bruce Lee, you know, often because of military service in the Pacific during, well, there was a lot of it. We've got World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War. Um, the truth is that the Asian hand combat community in North America had remained rather limited. And you can see these limitations manifest in a lot of ways, right? Few, there were individuals who did this, but there were fewer individuals doing the Asian martial arts in the 1950s or 60s than there are today. Nor did the martial arts enjoy this almost constant exposure in the media that we have all become very accustomed to. We're very used to being able to flip on the TV and you just expect to see martial arts happening somewhere on the dial, right? Um, but it wasn't always the case, right? If you do a survey of the pages of Black Belt Magazine, this is one of the research projects I'm working on right now, one of the things that you'll see is that during the 1960s, uh, almost all of the discussion of the martial arts focused only on the Japanese hand combat systems. And really, it was mostly judo versus karate. I mean, that's what you saw discussed. If they were going to be exceptionally eccentric, there might be an article on like kendo or Aikido, but it was really, you know, judo versus karate that we have in the early 1960s. Well, Bruce Lee shakes this up, right? With his initial appearance as Cato on the Green Hornet in 66, 67, and then of course his explosion onto the big screen uh, for North American audiences in 1973 with Enter the Dragon, this just has a profound effect on the place of the Asian martial arts in Western popular culture. I mean, we often forget that prior to the 1970s, most individuals had never heard of Kung Fu, right? Most individuals didn't know that the Chinese had also created hand combat systems of their own. Now, Bruce Lee's impact kind of had a dual focus. The first impact was on the pre-existing martial arts community, right? So he really whipped up a lot of interest in the Chinese martial arts within that pre-existing community. What was not evident at the time, in the late 1960s, was that the boundaries of that community were about to be very radically changed, right? We're gonna go from a relatively small community to something that's much, much bigger, to something that is a generalized cultural phenomenon. So 1973, we see the release of Enter the Dragon, and we get the news of Lee's death at the shockingly young age of 32. Now this film just captivated audiences in the West with its fight choreography, with its nods to Asian philosophy. This was something else that had been becoming very popular with the public in the post-World War II era. And to be honest, it's, it's kind of unabashed violence. Uh, concern that the public might not, the Western public again, might not respond well to a single leading Asian actor. Uh, the, the decision was made, and Bruce Lee actually agreed with this, he went along with this, that there should be a diverse cast. And so we see uh, John Saxon and Jim Kelly given, you know, these really prominent roles in the movie. Now these fears proved to be unfounded and that audiences around the globe really reacted quite well to Lee's charismatic performance. Still, this self-conscious decision to feature an ensemble cast for this, this key movie had a profound effect, right? Because it showed that the opportunities for personal or community empowerment uh, in the martial arts were accessible to everyone who was human. They were accessible to everyone regardless of their racial, national, economic, and social background. I mean, you know, when you look at, you know, Bruce Lee, John Saxon, and Jim Kelly, these are exactly the categories that those filmmakers are playing with. And again, that just had a profound resonance uh, with audiences. Now, Lee's untimely death in 1973 
crystallized this image at a very specific moment in time. It, you know, you can't go beyond this moment, right? So for his followers, he becomes this prophet who's snatched away at the very moment of revelation. Right? And so if you want to kind of come to terms with Lee's message, what do you do next? Well, you can't look forward to what Lee would have done. We don't really know. So instead, we're forced to look back. We look back to his previous films. We look to his television appearances. We look to his interviews, to his, assorting, his assorted writings, all things that can be easily commoditized and sold to the public. Which is, of course, fascinating because Lee himself becomes the great martial arts commodity. You know, I'm cataloging Black Belt magazine. I literally cannot even count how many times he has showed up in that magazine. I'm going to have to wait till I get to the end of the database and have a computer do it for me. It's stunning. But martial arts instruction itself was another thing that could be commoditized, another thing that could be sold to the public. So the wave of enthusiasm that was unleashed by Lee's sudden eruption into the popular consciousness filled every martial arts school or style, kind of regardless of where they came from, with new students who were seeking to experience for themselves these fighting systems. And as you'd expect, the Chinese martial arts, previously obscure, were really major beneficiaries of this. And Wing Chun itself, more than anyone else, right? Wing Chun's global evolution has forever been marked by its association with Bruce Lee, right? Now, while Lee had been involved with the film industry since he was, well, actually a baby in arms, he actually appeared in. Um, I think 20 films as a child actor. He was also an incredibly dedicated martial artist, right? He had first been introduced to Tai Chi with, through his father and then to the art of Wing Chun, apparently through the intervention of his mother. Uh, and he studied Wing Chun in Hong Kong in the 1950s with Ip Man, right? Now, after coming to the United States, Bruce Lee continued to teach a little bit. He continued to work to promote the Chinese martial arts. And he was very charismatic. He had these great personal skills. He was very uh, personable. He was good on TV. He had these roles. And this led to appearances in Black Belt magazine. And as he starts to show up in Black Belt magazine in the 1960s, he begins to talk about Wing Chun. He mentions his teacher, Ip Man. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, a lot of these images, like this one, get published in Black Belt magazine in the mid-1960s, where we see Ip Man doing Chi Sauer standing next to his increasingly famous martial arts student. This is really important, because given how little media exposure the martial arts as a whole receive in this period, especially the Chinese martial arts that get practically no media exposure during the middle of the 1960s, this was an unprecedented amount of publicity, right? What this means is that even before the advent of the Kung Fu craze in 1973, Bruce Lee has assured that his Sifu is going to be among the best known Chinese martial arts martial artists in the West. Okay? Of course, the Bruce Lee phenomenon is not restricted to Wing Chun. I, you know, it lifted many boats. Um, in truth, karate schools probably benefited more from Bruce Lee than anybody else because they were so widely distributed, you know? Yet, this transformation in the way that the global public perceived these fighting systems was not enough to save every traditional martial art that had been practiced in the early 20th century. Yeah, Wing Chun, Kung Fu, uh, Karate does great, but there are lots of Chinese martial arts and, and different styles that are starting to slip into obscurity in the 70s and 80s at exactly the same time that you know this, this select group of arts is being benefited. So what are some of the more material factors that can have contributed to this to the success of Wing Chun in the international system? I have a younger brother who is a professor of geography, and he'd be very happy to hear me say this. Don't tell him I'm going to say this. But I'd have to say the first thing that we need to consider is geography. This is probably the single most important variable, material variable out there. Exporting any good, regardless of whether it's a physical good or a cultural good, is expensive. 
It's this expense that limits the extent of trade that we see. All forms of trade are ultimately limited by what um, economists call transaction costs, right? And these costs include the expense of shipping a good, obviously, but also adapting it for a foreign market, translating it, selling it, right? Ip Man's flight to Hong Kong in 1949 was without a doubt the single most important event in the subsequent success of his art. Why? Well, Hong Kong occupied a very unique place in the global economic order. It had traditionally been this port uh, in which East and West met. It was the main trade port for all of southern China. And as a result, the residents of Hong Kong tended to be better connected, better plugged into the global market than individuals on the mainland. And again, you see these links manifest in a, a lot of different areas all of which serve to massively reduce Wing Chun's transaction costs, even compared to other arts from the region that were more popular at this point in time. Uh, Hong Kong itself was the most urban and modernized section of southern China. It really had a highly developed educational system. Interestingly enough, it was bottom heavy, though. It didn't have enough university capacity up at the top, which meant Hong Kong was always producing more really bright talented students than its own universities could absorb. And often, these students spoke English. Often, these students came from families that had either family connections or business connections abroad. And they couldn't necessarily get into the programs that they wanted to in Hong Kong. So in the 1950s and 60s, we see them setting out for North America, you know, Canada, England, Australia, South Africa, uh, where they're going to go to college. Now, Ip Ching, uh, one of the sons of Ip Man, has noted this pattern of out-migration as one of the main ways in which the socioeconomic status of Ip Man students really contributed to the startlingly rapid success of his art. What this means is that when that Bruce Lee phenomenon hits in 1973, all of these major cities already have Wing Chun students in them. And the nature of Wing Chun, where you have lots of sensitivity drills, is that a lot of these guys have already put together little study groups. So they can continue to do sticky hands. So they can continue to do chi sao. And immediately, they can begin to take on students. So there's this infrastructure in place latently waiting for Bruce Lee to hit. And you know more are going to follow in the late 70s and, and 80s. Other arts even ones that had been very, very popular um, might not have opportunities to take advantage of, of this windfall of these openings if they're located in areas of China that are less plugged into the global system. So I have a good friend right now who's actually writing a book on the martial arts of Southwest China, you know, which really struggle for recognition in the global arena. They're very popular locally. But you know, the issue is not many people from the Southwest had immigrated into the West uh, you know, during the 1970s. Likewise, when you look at martial arts communities in Hong Kong, you know, not all of these martial arts in Hong Kong had a relatively affluent, internationally connected group of English-speaking students who could just go out and promote this art you know, overnight. It's also important, I think, to, con uh, to consider the general attitude of these students and, and how their social attitudes actually interacted with their socioeconomic status. One of the things that I have noticed is that in the current era, there seems to be a little bit of a drive to reimagine the Wing Chun of the 1960s, there you go, as something more conservative than it actually was. We can see this in a number of areas. I mean, to begin with, there is uh, this reemergence of an emphasis on the discipleship system in a lot of Wing Chun schools. There is a lot of uh, enthusiasm every time someone announces the rediscovery of a lost lineage, usually claiming direct descent from the Shaolin Temple, wherever you imagine it was, um, or you know, one of these Qing re uh, revolutionary groups, whichever revolutionary group you happen to be imagining. Now, while discussing his Tai Chi community that he did uh, ethnography with in, in Shanghai, Adam Frank has argued that the shifting economic opportunities presented by global expansion 
are not always going to lead to more openness within a fighting style. At times, the pressures and opportunities of globalization, the, the potential profits that are out there, the need to differentiate your product in the market, the need to control where potentially lucrative teaching positions go within your organization, actually leads to a renewed emphasis on secrecy on clamping down on things. So we shouldn't assume that globalization is naturally going to lead to more openness. Sometimes it will in some systems, sometimes it won't in others. So how did Wing Chun and its various students appear to observers prior to the explosion of interest that Bruce Lee unleashes in 1973? Did this look like a relatively progressive art? Or was this more reactionary, right? Were these people seeking to preserve tradition? Luckily, we have a source on this. In 1969, a Wing Chun student named Rolf Klotznitzer uh, and his teacher Greco Wong published a book titled Wing Chun Kung Fu Chinese Self-Defense Methods, right? Uh, I think this is probably one of the earliest books on Wing Chun, certainly the earliest one in English, probably one of the earliest ones in any language. Klotznitzer had lived in Hong Kong as a youth. Uh, you know, he knew people that were in the Wing Chun world. And he'd actually interviewed Ip Man a couple of times in 1960, which is pretty earlier, or pretty early. He had gone on to study Wing Chun with, with one of Ip Man's most prominent students. And then after moving to the UK, he continued his studies with Greco Wong, who he co-authors this book with, who was also a student of Mo Yat, you know, who's another prominent Ip Man student. So consider the timing of this publication, right? 1969 is right before, it's a few years before this general explosion of interest that we see with Enter the Dragon. So this is a work that kind of offers us a window into how Ip Man's Wing Chun system was presenting itself and, and how it appeared to students prior to the Kung Fu craze and just the explosion of Orientalism that got unleashed by that. So here's our, our quote. I hope you can read it. I'm going to read along with you to help you out. Originally from Canton province, he migrated to Hong Kong, where he still resides, speaking of Ip Man here. An outspoken man, Ip Man regards Wing Chun as a modern form of Kung Fu, i.e., as a style of boxing highly relevant to modern fighting conditions. Although not decrying the undoubted abilities of gifted individuals and other systems, he nevertheless feels that many of their techniques are beyond the capabilities of ordinary students. Their very complexity requires years, if not decades, to master, and hence greatly reduces their practical value in the context of our fast-moving society where time is such a vital factor. Wing Chun, on the other hand, is an art of which an effective working knowledge can be picked up in a much shorter time than is possible in other systems. Now, now here is the, the boilerplate that you must see in, in all summaries of all hand combat styles. It is highly realistic, highly logical and economical, and able to hold its own against any other style or system of unarmed combat. Because of course. All right? Now, even more thought provoking for me is Klotznitzer's and Wong's description of Ip Man's students and how they compared as a social group to other groups of students that you might encounter in Hong Kong at that particular point in time. An interesting characteristic common to most practitioners of Wing Chun lies in their relatively liberal attitude to the question of teaching the art to foreigners. They are still very selective when it comes to accepting individual students. But compared with traditional Kung Fu men, they are remarkably open and frank about the art. If any one Chinese style of boxing is destined to become the first to gain popularity among foreigners, more likely than not, it will be Wing Chun. Now, Bruce Lee's rise to superstardom pushed Wing Chun onto a wider stage than Klotzenzer and Wong could have possibly imagined in 1969. Yet, as we have seen, the system did possess certain material characteristics that allowed it to capitalize on this windfall that Bruce Lee was presenting at exactly the same time that some of its very close cousins in you know, Hong Kong and in other places in China were kind of slipping into obscurity. 
The most important of these, again, is geography. It's Ip Man's decision to move to Hong Kong in 49, followed by his decision to streamline his art and the sorts of students that that attracted. Klotznitzer and Wong's early observation appears almost prophetic in the light of Wing Chun's subsequent emergence as you know, one of the most popular Chinese fighting styles out there. OK. Some accounts, such as those left by Chu Shangting, um, suggest that Ip Man liked to play the role of Confucian gentleman around his school. Or, or maybe it would be better to say he was a Confucian gadfly around his school. This projection, this embodiment of traditional values attracted a certain type of student in the Hong Kong period. Yet, as our previous quotes demonstrate, Wing Chun was understood by Ip Man, and I think it succeeded in large part because Ip Man understood it as a modern fighting system. Even Bruce Lee's films, which are you know, clearly examples of visual fantasy, retain this veneer of gritty reality to them, right? You know, his, his protagonists are always fighting against you know, social, racial, economic, national injustice at time periods when these problems are very much present in people's mind. And Lee's fame has done much to kind of give Ip Man a leg up, now not in the world of actually teaching martial arts, but in the world of being a media figure. Still, the Ip Man that has become most popular with audiences today is a very different sort of hero than his later student. Whereas Bruce Lee's films always appear to carry a sort of radical subtext, Ip Man, as he is being reimagined for the big screen, seems to be a much more conservative sort of a figure portrayed as a local and national hero, not in all of his films, but in many of them, he fights to retain the values and the hierarchies of the past rather than to go out there and to overthrow them. I think there are a number of ways of, a point, uh, of approaching this kind of disjoint. When reimagining Ip Man for the big screen, it's not enough to just view him as the local kung fu teacher that he actually was anymore. I mean, for these movies to succeed, they had to succeed with audiences in Hong Kong, but then also audiences in mainland China. And it would be really great if they could succeed with some audiences in the West, too. And that meant adopting a dual or multivariant discourse where Ip Man finds expression on the one hand as a local hero, but then also as a national hero, and then also as an Asian hero. And I think Wilson Ip's 2008 film succeeded precisely because he really masterfully pulled off this balance of competing audience interests. He really understood what was at stake in terms of how people were going to try to read Ip Man. Okay? So what is the significance of this current reimagining of Ip Man for those of us in martial arts studies? Well, Peter Bayer might remind us that there's more than one way to think about globalization, right? While a continuation of the drive uh, towards modernity that begins in Europe, we can also understand this, he tells us, as a fundamental transformation in the way that meaning is communicated between individuals and society. And this more conceptual understanding of globalization, I think, shines a different light on why people might be turning to the martial arts in the current era and what function they're expecting them in general and Wing Chun in particular to actually perform for them. So according to Bayer then, the process of globalization has resulted in uh, traditional means of value creation in society being displaced by schools of thought that privilege efficiency and professionalism. Religious modes of communication, of course, have been the great loser in this process. Uh, indeed, Bayer's work, his research, is fundamentally concerned with the fate of organized religion kind of as, as social institutions in a modern global world. So what does he say? To create systems of meaning, which can then go on to support all kinds of you know, political or social projects, religions and other forms of generalized communication tend to begin by positing the existence of two realms. Uh, and you know, not just Bayer, but very often in religious scholarship, we refer to these as the transcendent and the imminent. 
There you go. Everyone's fam favorite, you know, anonymous description of the transcendent and the imminent. Now, given that the imminent defines the totality of our daily existence, everything that we interact with, we actually have real trouble talking about it. Because we don't have any exterior points of reference, any fixed points that we can define uh, our values and our concepts from. So religions and other traditional ways of making meaning step into this breach by positing the existence of a transcendent state, a state in which Everything that we know in the imminent, yeah, it doesn't exist, right? Everything is different there. And that gives them a monopoly on socially meaningful modes of communication. And that allows them to make themselves really useful in all kinds of parts of society that at first don't really appear to have much to do with religion at all. This balance then gets upset by the rise of more technical, professional modes of action during the modern era. Why? Well, highly focused technical modes of communication are just more efficient than those that are based on general cultural values. And modern societies value this increase in efficiency. As a matter of fact, modern societies are this increase in efficiency, at least in Bayer's conception. So as a result, the priests and the nuns that had overseen so many elements of Western society have been replaced by the doctors, the nurses, the teachers, the psychologists, the counselors, the bureaucrats that we have now, right? Now this same process of increased professionalization and specialization is expressed all over the globe. Nor are religious institutions the only ones that are challenged by this fundamental shift in how social values are conveyed. Bayer points out that any generalist mode of communication can find itself threatened by this increase in professionalism and um, rationalism that comes along with globalization. Right? In fact, when individuals talk about the declining popularity of the Chinese martial arts in mainland China, this is you know, a big thing that gets discussed on the internet these days, a uh, classic example of this is the People's Liberation Army increasingly moving away from these sorts of kung fu demonstrations, hard qigong demonstrations, lots of kung fu training uh, you know, in their camps. This has been a big part of what the PLA has done for decades. And uh, in their current push to modernize the army, they're getting rid of all this stuff. They're abandoning all this stuff. And they're, they're having newspaper articles and press releases about how they're abandoning all of this stuff, right? And this is exactly the sort of narrative that people turn to when they, move, when they go to explain this. They tell us that the traditional mar martial arts are just incompatible with the demands of modernity. And that's why the PLA is going to have to give them up, okay? So this is a very brief summary of what is a very thick, complex book you know, that, that Bayer has put out there. But I think it's instructive. Contrary to the expectations of early modernization and secularization theorists, religion and ethnicity have not simply vanished into that good night. They're still with us. Instead, the disruptions created by globalization have presented the leaders of these groups with new opportunities to retain their social relevance. Right? On the one hand, they can focus on new aspects of public performance. This means finding some secondary problem that has been created by social and economic change and addressing it. And this is often a fairly liberal solution, not always. You see it in the religious world with liberation theology in Latin America, you know, Catholic priests going out to organize unions and copper mines, things like that. In the West, uh, growing emphasis on environmental awareness in, in liberal Protestant churches. Um, but it's not the only strategy that is available to these sorts of groups. Other organizations have instead adopted uh, a more conservative approach by refocusing their energies on these questions of fundamental communication about the transcendent, right? And this second strategy is really especially useful if you're interested in questions of identity and hence the definition and the boundaries of community, 
who's inside the community, who's outside the community in the face of global pressure. Because again, this is one of the things that globalization does. You know, it, it creates the potential for these boundaries to become fuzzy and flexible. Such approaches have proved to be really popular and their influence can be seen in basically the rise of fundamentalism in every single global religious community that we have today. Nor is there any reason to think that this basic palette of options is in any way restricted to discussions of religion. Douglas Weil has noted that the disruptions which imperiled the Chinese empire in the 19th century, you know, Taiping Rebellion, uh, Opium Wars, things like that, that, they badly shook that society's self-confidence. And this in turn became a critical moment in the creation and modernization of Tai Chi, right? He argues that the Wu brothers' subsequent research and development of the Tai Chi classics can directly be understood as an attempt to reevaluate and to reassemble what was modern in, sorry, what was valuable in Chinese culture in the face of this modernist existential threat from the West. So while Tai Chi clearly has technical roots that stretch back for centuries, it's this late 19th century social agenda expanded and reimagined in explicitly nationalist terms during the 20th century, which is what most people are actually interacting with and, and experiencing today. Still, there are debates. What should Tai Chi be, right? On the one hand, uh, you know, when you do ethnography, you run into teachers and students that see Tai Chi as essentially a repository of what is essentially Chinese, right? While foreign students were told, you know, okay, okay they, they can learn this discipline, they can learn these techniques, it's doubtful that they can ever collate the <clears throat> mass of deep cultural knowledge that really resides, we're told, at the heart of these systems. So for these practitioners and, and for these instructors then, what is at the root of this system is an essentialist ideal of, of racial or national identity. But not everybody agrees with this, right? There are other reformers out there that claim, no, for Tai Chi to survive in the modern world, what it needs is reform. It needs to change. Um, you know, specifically, it has got to adapt to meet the needs, of, the needs of a very different student body, right? An aging population can benefit from the increased health and, and balance that comes from daily form practice. Busy corporate executives can learn simplified versions of the form for uh, stress relief. And I think we're all familiar with the idea of, you know, Sifu or Sensei as life coach. Right? That, that's probably something that you know, we all have a little bit of experience with. So again, here we see Bayer's two adaptive strategies that he said would be open to all traditional modes of communication threatened by globalization. The first camp has, has focused on this question of primary communication, which in the modern era so often finds its expression in terms of cultural or national identity. And the second group has instead sought to address those ancillary problems created by life in an increasingly fast-paced modern society. You know, how do you deal with the little hurts of daily life? This same process can also be seen and understood in the Wing Chun community. Certain schools continue to focus on the solutions that Wing Chun can offer, you know, be they self-defense, health, psychological well-being, you know, that sort of thing. But not every discussion of Wing Chun tends in that very, you know, technical vein. You see lots and lots of people that are really interested in getting back to this, right, in getting back to Wing Chun's ancient past, a supposedly more authentic past in which we learn what the real nature of the art and the real nature of the student is. And again, I find it fascinating that so often uh, these discussions are rooted in nationalist myths or myths of national and community resistance that are found uh, in the, the mythos of the Shaolin Temple or late Qing revolutionary groups. Indeed, the impulse to see Ip Man as more than just a southern kung fu teacher 
is not confined to the recent films. This isn't, you know, just a, a kung fu film phenomenon. It also reflects fundamental currents within the Wing Chun community. What defines the heart of this system? What should it become in the future? Is this a style built around technical solutions to technical problems? Or is this a space where students can imagine a better, more empowered version of who they are. In conclusion, I would like to turn to a few lines of dialogue from a more recent reimagining of, of, of Ip Man. Uh, in Wong Kar Wai's 2013 film, The Grand Master, we find Ip Man accepting a challenge from a northern master who has come down to, let, let's say, you know, pass on the mantle of leadership. That, that's what he's interested in. And they are, you know, debating slash <coughs> dueling over that particular pastry there. And as they're going through this and talking about the northern and the southern martial arts, if man interjects, he, he doesn't like where this is going, and he says something very interesting. He says, the world is a big place. Why limit it to north and south? It holds you back. To you, this cake is the country. To me, it is so much more. Break from what you know, and you will know more. The southern martial arts are bigger than just the north and south. This scene is fascinating to me because it seems to consciously contemplate the rise of Ip Man as an as a global icon, as a cultural icon, and then goes on to address what this means in explicit terms. What are the value of the southern Chinese martial arts? Are they only an expression of local identity? Are they subservient to a nationalist dream? Or do they transcend these two things, right? Can they become more? Nor, if Bayer is correct, should we expect to see this debate resolved at any point in the near future. A dispute between positions representing such fundamentally different sets of possibilities can't be resolved nicely and neatly. The dialectic tension between these two competing visions of what the martial arts are I think powers a lot of their practice. It powers the great conversations and debates that we're having about them today. While these fighting systems may appear to be traditional to outsiders, in their present form, they are inescapably the product of a modern global world. Ip Man's actual genius lay in his perception and his embrace of this fundamental truth. Thank you very much. Uh, hippies. You didn't mention hippies at all. At I had a hippie typeface up there. I, uh, I, I just, I, it's more of a comment, but mm -hmm. probably have a response. Um, Bruce Lee mm -hmm. was a hippie, mm -hmm. but the hippies clearly considered him a hippie. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I grew up in San Francisco in the sort of center of that. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and uh, of course, Tai Chi was right. I mean, everybody did Tai Chi. Yeah. It was all the gay thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, as were computers. Um, and in some sense, uh, the hippie movement is was not only the biggest small business explosion ever, it was also the largest um, and, and the source of modern computing. Um, it was also the, the uh, maybe the biggest movement toward authenticity, like yeah. the claim of authenticity. Yeah. Um, and so I just was like, whoa, that was like a blast back toward Asia. And, yeah. and there's been lots of reactions. Yeah, it's interesting. When you look at uh, the, the Chinese martial arts community in New York during the 60s and 70s, particularly the Tai Chi community, but you know other parts of the New York community, you see the same thing. 
it's totally dominated by hippies. And then it's fascinating to see these, in some senses, very conservative uh, instructors coming out of Taiwan and, you know, the, the nationalist government that are showing up. It's like, okay, these are my students now. Now teaching martial arts to hippies. And I, it's amazing the accommodation they made. I actually did originally talk a little bit about um, kind of the radicalism of Bruce Lee's message, right, and how Bruce Lee was detaching his version of modernization from these nationalist goals and attaching it to these more radical, you might want to say hippie goals, but yeah, limits of time and didn't make it. Didn't make the final cut. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. I'm looking forward to your book. Could you say a little bit more about um, the kind of socioeconomic differences between Wing Chun and Hong Kong and the other martial arts? You, you alluded to this, but I'd like to know more. It's a comp okay, it's obviously complicated because things change over time, right? That's the one thing that really strikes me out these discussions. We want everything to be nice and set. And, and in fact, the Chinese martial arts are fascinating because things are rapidly changing, right? So it changes throughout Ip Man's career, even in Hong Kong. But in general, the quick answer is that Kung Fu tended to be kind of a proletariat sort of an activity. A lot of working class people are involved in this. And that's true both you know, prior to 1949 and after 1949 in the mainland and in Hong Kong. And Wing Chun, one of the reasons it's interesting is it kind of escapes that or orbit. It's a little bit more of a bourgeois thing, right? It's the sons of pawn shop owners. The you know business owners, restaurant owners, right? People who are independently wealthy, people who are independently wealthy and might need to train guards to you know watch their wealth. Uh, so there is an element of of class, and, and I, I mean that in the modern Western sense because we're into the 1920s here. People are becoming conscious of class. There is an element of class in how the martial arts. Uh, of southern China and Foshan kind of lined up with different social classes, even different unions. They're associated with different labor unions. And, you know, Wing Chun is, is very much differentiating itself in that term. If man gets to Hong Kong and things change at first, you know, suddenly his students are, are those proletariat, you know, restaurant workers. But then by the time you get to the mid to late 50s, things have shifted again and suddenly he has lots of I call them the, the angry young men, but they're really wealthy, angry young men. People did 
many forms of hand combat, you know, prior to modernity, but in a lot of ways, they're different. You know, those would have found very different expressions. People would have felt differently about doing them than we do with the modern martial arts. When, when you look at your internal mental package of ideas that you carry around with you about what makes something a modern art, yeah, that is modernity. And that's because one of the first things you imagine is, ah, it's traditional. But, you know, the term traditional only makes sense when there's an alternative to it, right? You know, when, when, when you know, you're turning away from, from, from something, right? And so I guess what modernity allows you to do is to imagine a traditional world, which may or may not have existed exactly that way. And, yeah, that's going to be the root of, you know, a lot of, you know, your modern entertainment. And, you know, whether that happens in a training hall or, or a cinema screen, I, there's probably some fundamental links there. Historical mm -hmm. questions, mm -hmm. um, and thank you for that wonderful mm -hmm. talk. Uh, the first one is about the status of karate mm -hmm. in the 1960s, and uh, as I'm sure you know, that was also the case in Hong Kong too. Yeah. Karate was, you know, the hot thing, and Wong Yu, who plays the Chinese boxer in 1970, uh, was actually famous to Hong Kongers for breaking bricks on television, and then he. Mm -hmm. was a, trained in Japan and then mm -hmm. appears in this violently mm -hmm. anti-Japanese movie. So how do you, um, what can you suggest about how that glow around karate dispersed? In other words, what's the, like karate has not disappeared, yeah. but it loses its heat uh, as, as a popular thing. How do you think that process works, the unrolling of popularity? Oh, okay. I see where you're going. Yeah. No, no what, what you said, and then. <laughs> right? Is there a second part? No, there's a second question. So that's. Uh... Uh, that's okay. I, 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 I haven't, you know, written about this and, and thought about the unrolling of popularity extensively. I've been more concerned with just the popularity part. You know, that, that'll have to be the next stage of this process. But, you know, I expect that there is a certain amount, there's a certain balance in terms of your distance from mainstream society that you have to maintain to be popular. Again, this is an idea that I'm going to pull from the religious studies literature, right? So when they're talking about, you know, why do strict churches succeed in the religious studies literature, you know, what they find is that you have to be different enough from the surrounding society that you're offering people a viable alternative and you have to pre prevent, you have to present barriers to entry so you assure that everyone within this community is really dedicated to it like you are, right? But if you become too separate, well, then you're just a violent cult and, and you have real trouble recruiting members. And if you become, you know, too much like the rest of society, then there's no reason to join. There's no reason to do this rather than bowling on any given Tuesday night. And I suspect that one of the things that we have seen with the traditional martial arts is that in the 1960s, when we're talking about our hippies, these were radical values. And now they're not so much radical values. We have acculturated these values, right? That has been one of the ways that globalization is expressed in, in the West, right? Globalization, like any form of consumption, changes both the buyer and the seller. Our culture is changed by globalization too, right? And as we acculturate these values, um, I think it, you know, they, they lost that initial edge that they had and, and it became like doing bowling on a Tuesday night. You know, you sign your kids up for Tiger Taekwondo, but, you know, it's not something that an angry teenager is necessarily going to invest his time in. He's, he's going right for that MMA class. Yeah. I wonder whether we should defer the second yes. question so that we can try and stay on time. We'll, we'll go straight to parallel sessions, possibly by the toilet or something, but more or less straight. Thank you, Ben Judkin. Yeah.